So yeah. Um, yeah. Hmm? Hmm? Okay. Live? Cool. Yeah. Uh, well, thanks for coming. This is a slightly, very much improvised speech. We all know Guybrush is having problems with the back, and 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 I just decided I should save face and jump. Um, and I'm not going to talk about processing. If anyone is interested in what Guybrush was supposed to talk, he has a website at apparently this is possible.com. And there's some CDs he gave us to, to give away, so afterwards you can just pick one up. What I decided to talk about, which is basically the only thing we became famous for as conspiracy, is 64K intros. And um, I'm not sure how workshoppy it will be, because I'm not going to uh, tell you how to use our tool, because I mean, I mean, it's kind of hectic anyway. But I'm very much a fan of the principle of, you know, teach a man to fish and he will never ask you for food again. So it's much better if you learn how it essentially works. I'm going to present to you uh, our old tool called Attic 2. Uh, and for I think it's sort of world first when we present our next generation tool, which is kind of flaky, like it mostly works. But um, hopefully it doesn't. I mean, I had to actually hex edit the whole thing to 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 make it work on my laptop because there are other coders in Europe and he already left. So it might work, might not work. Um, and also, I'm going to present to you the the synthesizer I use for music. So it's like it's going to be in this a whole all over thing about what we use for 64k intros. Now, first the principle of what's a 64k intro. 64k intro is a, it's an executable file that is up to 64 kilobytes is large, and um, it, it's self-contained. It contains every data and code. And when you run it, you get this several minute show of visuals and music and everything. Now, uh, a lot of people, the first knee-jerk reaction is it's not even possible. Because when you, you, know, you have your basic compiler, uh, Visual Studio, or even GCC, you just compile a, a hello world and you get, I don't know, probably 20 to 30 kilobytes of executable. And um, a very important part is that to realize that um, what you get right there is just the beginning. And um, a lot of people don't get it, that how it's possible. Now, uh, the first thing to realize and to understand about 64 key interest is that you have to understand the difference between code and data. The th these things are absolutely essential. Think of an image of white noise, right? Take it like 256 by 256 pixels of RGBA white noise. You can probably store it in, in several hundred kilobytes, even if you compress it, right? So it's a rather large amount of data. And because of the entropy, you can't really compress it really well. But if you think about it, you can use one line of single code, you know, just stdio random function to actually reproduce it. So the data is large, but the code that produces it is small. So all the trick about it is finding the right code that can present aesthetically pleasing visuals and then somehow making an interface that can, is able to produce us the code and the data in the user-friendly form to be able to come out with all these visuals and sound. So what we have to do is create a lot of filters and generators and, and effects and all these kind of stuff to create various forms that we are used to, various shapes and, and, and graphics that we are actually comfortable working with in a normal life as well. Something, you know, we have to emulate our own tools because we don't like the own commercial tools which we are used to, because otherwise we're running into our own traps. And then what we have to do is use the process to actually create our own content, but not store the content itself. We have an end product. What we are interested in is that 64K intros are essentially what we call the nonlinear non editing. You, can, you have this like chain of processing data starting from basically some base product and a lot of like filtering, 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 filtering and then you have the end composite image. It's very similar to like sound when you have like, I don't know, a, a guitar sample and you just put like distortion on it and then you put reverb on it and then you put, I don't know, mix it and filter it and EQ it and all stuff and in the end you have the final guitar sound. 
it's still just basically a starter sound and three effects. If we remember the chain, the history of how we made that final sound, we can reproduce it anytime we want in any certain way we want. Now this gives us a couple of advantages. When we are using this method, we can always and always change any immediate step. Which means that if we want a bit more distortion, if we already just keep the final wave, we can't go back, we can't un-EQ it, and we can't un-reverb it, and then change the distortion. But we, if you, we have the whole entire nonlinear chain, then we can just take the middle step, tweak it a bit more, and it goes all through the steps, and get we have the final wave with our desired changes as well. And of course, it's a lot smaller. We have some basic original data, and then we have the chain of effects. So what we have is just a pile of code. You know, code is small. We all know code is small. If you, re if you really want to make code small, you can make code small. It's just code. And it compresses well. And then you have data. And the data is just steps. Call this function with these parameters. Call this function with these parameters. Then pass this data to this function. It's just almost as if we would write just only code. But then, we, because we were visual people and we like a uh, like very tangible interface, very tactile things, we make an interface for it. And we just store these like, kind of recipes for what the data is supposed to be. And in the end, all we have to do is take the code, take the data, feed it into it, and in the final version, we have our content. Now, 64Ks already have this certain methodology of, of how stuff is made. When you're making real-time visuals, and let's go through the visual part first, you certainly need textures, you need meshes, you need animation, you need spot filtering. Um, so what we created here is some sort of intro package where you can cover all these kind of stuff. And this is OpenGL. Uh, this is pretty old, uh, but we did some spectacular things with it. Um, our first step was always a texture generator. Textures are probably the largest amount of data because it's per pixel data, especially if you're going to large resolution textures. It takes a lot of memory, a lot of time to create, and stuff like that. And of course, a lot of data in the end. I mean, even if we would take a screenshot and save it in JPEG, it still wouldn't be less than 64K. So we need to procedurally generate. The trick is we have several little filters where we can use this kind of little blobby stuff to create our own uh, little pictures. So what you see here in the right is how the final image would look like if I would allow this filter to happen. Now this is a standard subplasma. Subplasma is basically just taking random dots, uh, well actually a grid of dots with random colors and then just taking a spline and interpolating the colors. So it's really just almost white noise with like a, 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 a spline function when you zoom in it. So uh, again, you can change, just change the random seed and, and also you can change the density of the dots. So if I drag this all the way down, it gets a lot more bigger blobs. And then if I pull it up, then I get smaller blobs. And of course, this, doesn't, this alone doesn't look that good. We can just say it's, it's, it's basically almost just noise. And we have a couple of other effects like, you know, standard dots, which I can just change the size. Or you can have little random noises. We, have, we can have... Uh, gradients, and uh, we can ha have fonts, and you know, just, just change the size and font and, and all that kind of stuff. So it's, it's, it's really just rudimentary stuff. Now, um, you may wonder how that becomes uh, an interesting thing. The other, the other important part is the distortion. Now, distortion is almost familiar from if, if you ever use some, some commercial editing software. Distortion basically means that you take one image, you take another image as data, and pure data. So we're not talking about pictures, not necessarily talking about pictures. We're talking about something that can distort something else. What we can do is we can take this image, the grainier noise, and then take the other one as data, and then use distortion on it. And I can just adjust this 
to any rate, just keep watching the preview what I'm doing, is that I'm able to adjust the distortion factor really easily. And if I apply it, then it becomes this more distorted image. And all I did, remember what I just did. I had two subplasma effects. Now these are just, again, white noise with cubic interpolation. And then I applied basically something like, take this pixel on the other image, take the volume of it, which is, you know, from 0 to 255. This is like black to white. So white means a lot of distortion. Black means no distortion. And then just push the other image in that direction. And basically, if you think about it, this is around probably 10 lines of code and about four bytes of data. Now, that's a good trade-off for something. And that final image is already about 20K in JPEG. And we're not even talking about uncompressed size. So you can see how a little amount of code and a little amount of data can result in a lot of the content. And of course, there's a lot of like silly distortion stuff, like like you know the standard twirl and and, and all this kind of stuff. And um, another important part is that you have to add color, and there's a lot of like tricky color effects we can use and and give it like silly psychedelic feel to hold the whole thing. I'm probably not this, that good at this because I'm I'm not a graphics artist. But um, it's the same thing. It's just using these textures as data. And, and, and um, what, all, what you can also do is uh, one of my favorite stuff is that you just copy this thing, and there's this filter called the emboss. Now, you, can, you might be familiar with this from Photoshop. Embossing means that basically you take the contrast of an image, you take the edges of the image, and then create this. Uh, very interesting colored stuff from it. And um, this is almost what, what, what modern programmers would call a normal map. It's not a normal map, but it's very similar. Basically, what you see there is the height map dif differences of the image. It's really hard to explain. But basically, what, you mean, what it means is that uh, sharp turns in the image, like sharp edges in the image, we'll get a lot more of this um, bright parts. Now, what you can use with this is that th we have a filter called the shade. Now, what the shade does is that it takes the image, takes another image as a data. And uh, what you can do is you can kind of like use this to, uh, well, shade the image. Basically, what you do is take that um, channel, what you're using, and then kind of use this to apply a certain brightness ramp to the entire thing. And if you use this with an emboss thing, then it gets this really nice uh, bumpy feel to it. Now, this is just an example. Now, this texture doesn't look that good. You can all see that. But the point is, we're still around less than 30 bytes with data. And if you let the graphician learn it, he can come up with interesting stuff as well. Now, what I said about nonlinear thing, and I'm going to show you this, is that any of these parts can be edited. So if I want to go back to the first subplasma and change the granularity, I already have a different data. I just went back and I said, you know, I want a different stuff. And if I want to change the random seed, I can do it. This is because everything is procedural. You have the chain of data. You have the chain of effects. You can any point change anything. And if I want to say, OK, I don't need this much resolution. It's just blobs anyway. I switch down, and you can see it's already a lot lower resolution, or even completely you know, blurry crap. Or I can just go all the way up. And this is going to hurt my poor laptop. but. Now you can see it's, it's in extremely high resolution. Well, compared to what quality it is, anyway. So you can do all these kind of stuff. Very simple. And anything in 64K demo making is all about using this technique. Just taking 
very little amount of starting data. You can use, a, you can use low resolution pictures to start. Because I mean, if you can compress, I don't know, let's say you want the logo or vector animation, some vector stuff. You just draw it in, in your favorite tool, export it, you can still have probably uh, data of a vector logo in probably a couple of hundred bytes at most. You can just load it in and then you can you know, post-process it. You can add color to it later and in the end, it finally you have your actual final great image. And it's still it's like 100 bytes of starting data. Then you have like 20 bytes of post-processing. You're still way, way under a kilobyte with a code included. So it's absolutely plausible for 64 ks to have this amount of data. It's just people never realize the trick. Um, obviously, textures alone ain't won't, cut, won't cut it. So what we did is uh, we included a complete package. Textures need to be applied on meshes. Now, a mesh is basically the 3D object. Now, 3D objects are a bit harder to generate in terms of uh, it's not just the field of pixels. It's not just a 2D image. But you can also break it down to simple parts. You can start with Euclidean geometry. You can start with cubes, spheres, I don't know, um, various like hedrons and, and, and shapes and sizes. And, and you can also use some tricks, what we call the lofting, which means that you take a spline and take another spline and you pull it through. And it becomes like this tube kind of stuff. And also you can use super shapes and, 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 and all that kind of stuff. So what we did was um, we created this package where you are able to create uh, this very convenient way of uh, using textures and, 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 and applying them to meshes. Now, this intro is mostly spheres, because it's a planetary stuff. But um, as you can see, you can do some a more complex geometry. Now, what we did with this one is, uh, again, starter data and then distortion, distortion, distortion. What we did is take a sphere, take a noise map, which is I don't know, you can just generate it from a texture, take a noise map, apply it to it, and um, I wish I'd remember how to do it. Uh, what you can do is use the noise map, texture map it onto the sphere, and then for every vertex of the object, see what the texture text cell right there is. And if it's dark, then just don't move it. If it's bright, then according to the brightness, pull that vertex out. Like, you know we have a sphere, and you have surface normals, which are pointing outside. So if you distort by the surface normal, you can then get these like spike ball kind of things. And that's what we did on this one. Basically, we took a sphere and uh, did some very basic distortion on it. And you can see that it gets becomes uh, this uh, kind of uh, blobby thing. Now, I know this sounds like, oh, we can only make abstract stuff in it. But I'm going to show you an intro, or, or at least the data from the intro, uh, of what we did for Breakpoint 2004. And we weren't sure what is gonna, how it's going to turn out. But in the end, it became actually really amusing on what you can do just by, just by using procedural generation. Uh, yeah. This guy is entirely made of just these methods, right? So what we did is like start out from a sphere, and then, uh, and then, uh, just use these methods to uh, create this head out of it, basically. And uh, I'm not sure if I can hide the thing, but. Um, It's been ages since I used this, but um, I 
I can just, yeah. See, this is just a head, right? This also came out from a sphere. We just took the sphere and created this texture map, which I hope I can find. I think it's one of these. What we did is we took a sphere and we applied a couple of what we call the polygon selections on it. We didn't want to distort the entire sphere because otherwise you get have, you'd probably get a chin on the back side. So what we did is take a sphere, select which part do you want to take care of. Again, this is procedur procedural data. If you create a sphere, you can ensure that the polygons will be created the same way every time you run it. Basically, what this means is that if you say, I want to select polygons from 0 to 10, you can be assured, because it's the same code running all the time, you can be assured that the polygons 0 to 10 will be the same, on the same place all the time. So we just took this and applied a little distortion, and that's how it ended up. Uh, I don't think you can show this. Uh Yeah, it's, it's a bit hectic to use this tool. It's been a while as well. So, um, and I'm a musician anyway, so it doesn't matter. But uh, the point is you can also create more lifelike things with, with uh, procedural generation. And all it took was just, you know, we have to a know where you're aiming at and just break it down to parts and see what's possible and what's not. And we also did an interesting intro. Uh, which had basically what the aim was for us is just to uh, basically do a short movie, something that, that's more movie, like more cinematic in 64K. And we pulled that off and became, well, mildly successful. In looking back, it's, it's actually really bad looking at parts, but it was at the time we were really proud that we actually managed to pull it off. It was, everything was procedural. Everything, what we did in this intro, was uh, completely done with this tool. And by the way, this tool is freely downloadable from a website, which is conspiracy.hu. You can download it, try it, and, and complain about, well, that it doesn't work. But please don't complain. We don't support this anymore. We don't want to hear about it anymore. It's we just want. 64 bit Vista right now. So hmm? <laughs> it's running on Vista right now. All the better. <laughs> it's like, keep it away from us. <laughs> Not Vista, our tool. So what we did with this intro is, uh, well, kind of like this. I, mean, I think this kind of looks nice for 64K. <laughs> and this is just the first part. Because what we did, uh, I can't show the intro because, I mean, you can see what, what speed it runs at, is that we also have like the city, and then the city gets destroyed by comets. And then we have this final big, final big explosion, and, and you know, it's, it's basically deep impact in 64K. And it goes for like eight minutes, and then we have the phoenix rising, and you don't want to see the first version of the phoenix. God, it looked like a penguin. But <laughs> I remember, I mean, our graphics artist is a genius. He's fantastic when it comes to design and everything, but his modeling skills are still something he's learning. And I remember him sitting at a computer. We logged ourselves up in one of our flat, uh, coders' flats, and he was trying to make this bird and oh, this bloody bird took like ages because like, he was hun hunched over and he looked like he was like this. And it was completely silly. But it, it, it is also entirely procedural. It's just that when you're working with Photoshop, when you're working with 3ds Max, when you're working with any tool, you're used to certain methods. And if the, your tool doesn't know those methods, it's kind of hard that you can actually like, you know, shape, w shape these things the normal way you should be able to. So what we did, he kind of had to, you know, 
relearn how to model things, and especially this bloody bird, which took like I don't know many ages. But one of the interesting things you see there is the particle system, which is completely running independently. And this is what I usually like to prove that the whole thing is real time and not pre-rendered. Is that I can just stop at any point, scroll back, and I don't know, you know, change it every th every, to every point, and the particle system is still running. So. Uh, it's very nice to prove that uh, this is not pre-rendered. Even if it's 64K, some people say, you know, it's like, you know, 64K and like, like a 200 megabyte AVI file. So no, it's actually real-time rendered all the way. And because of this non-linear editing thing, you, but also one of the nice things you can do, not just for the particle systems, but if I, uh, for example, let's take a look at the end scroller. Okay, this is the slowest part apparently, but um, let's look for a part that has like, some nice prose processing to it. This is pretty slow, but still. What you can do is, is you can change the editing. Uh, oh, yeah, here, here's a good one. You can change the, the parameters of any of these post-filtering effects, basically runtime. And if you want to tweak some more, you're basically welcome to do it during while well, the whole thing is running. Now, one of the important things is that I've been talking about nonlinear editing a lot. And I said, you know, you can edit textures nonlinearly, you can edit uh, meshes nonlinearly, you can do the compositing nonlinearly. But the important part is to realize that if you have one tool, then nonlinear editing actually arches over the entire process. And what I mean by that is that, let's say you have this like uh, CD texture. Like, you see that? Like, you know, that building. Now, I can go to the texture generator, find that. Uh huh. Concrete, no. CD. Let's see which one. Anyway, uh, what I can do is go to the editing uh, tool, change some parameters. When I say change. And um, change some more to actually destroy everything. And you can see it already screwed up, like the middle part. Now, the nice thing about this is that at any point of intro making, you see, you can think like, OK, this object looks nice, and the texture is nice, but the two don't seem to fit. So just go back to the texture, edit something, and immediately you have the change right there. So if I say, you know, there should be a lot less windows on the, on the building, I can just go there and take this and say, you know, we only need one window. And now it has less windows. So everything is nonlinear. Everything is started from procedural scratch and ends up with the content. Now, this is very similar to ways of working if you take, you know, you have revision control and you take backups and, 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 and you have source files and stuff like that. If you have one nice big package, then, then the whole thing is a lot, lot easier. And this is basically the concept of procedural generation and 64K stuff. Now, uh, it doesn't end here, and I'm like this is I like to show my favorite part because I'm more of an audio guy. It's like how to make the whole thing have sound. Uh, if you've been working in, in studio environments, or at least have some knowledge about music or, or how electronic music is nowadays produced, uh, 
You notice they, they also use a lot of nonlinear editing tools like I don't know, Cubase and, and Acid Pro and, and, and Nuendo and the list goes on. And um, what they also do is they have VSTs, VSDIs, they just tape, write a synth line, you know, just put some notes and it goes through filters and, and all that kind of stuff. And in the end they have the MP3 or, or Wave or, or Disc or whatever. So uh, if you think about that, this really f very much fits in our procedural world because what you have to do is write a synthesizer, write the music, store the music data, you know, songs, notes, beats, whatever, the processing chain, and in the end, just, you know, render it again. Now, uh, real-time uh, rendering of music, real-time synthesis, is, has been really popular because we have all these huge processors nowadays, Core 2 Duo and all this kind of stuff. It can easily handle playing a music in the instant. Now, the nice thing about it is that it comes with the perk that, you know, one of the old methods of, of, of 64K intro making was that you had a synth, you programmed it, you know, you tweaked all little settings, and it would dump you this file, which is the music, well, which is the, the instrument, and you would put it in a tracker, and then compose music from all these little samples. The downside was that it wasn't entirely nonlinear the way you wanted it, because it was, you know, still like, you know, type some bytes into the synthesizer, it puts out something, then you load it, you know, it wasn't one big thing. So the nice thing about real-time synthesis, and I know this is going to crash, because buzz is a piece of <laughs> but <laughs> Oh, it didn't. It's awesome. This is probably the first time it did that. <laughs> now he's on TV, he's like, shit. And the nice part is, um, I'm trying to make this not so loud, too loud. Is that any time? This is entirely real time. You can, you know, you can hear it. That the moment I pushed play, everything started out. This is in my new generation of synth. Uh, what you can do is just go back here. This is the synth module, not really friendly, but at least it's it's working. So if I want to say, you know, I want it less detuned, I can just pull it down and say. You can already hear it's more, a lot more sharper. And I pull it back up. Or I can just say, you know, I want higher frequencies. More sharper. Or I want the LFO to be faster. I mean, you can just go bonkers with it. I mean, that's the way you write music. That's the way you do it. It's like. In a studio, you obviously use hardware synthesizers. You take your access wires, which is the greatest synth of, synth of all times. You sit down and you start, you know, tweaking knobs and, and, and hoping something cool comes out. So this method of using a synthesizer, it's a really, really nice way of doing things. It's really, really convenient. I mean, this was the this is my new generation of synths. I was really happy that I'm gonna finish it. It was the first time I actually had a synthesizer that sounded the way I wanted to. And I just sat down and wrote this song in like 50 minutes because it was that easy. And the end result, uh, this actually song actually finished second uh, last week at Breakpoint in the executable music competition. And I was really happy with the end result. And the final size was 16K of executable. And that's unoptimized. So that's just, you know, I didn't bother. It was under size limit. So it was like, who cares? <laughs> I was actually wondering like, if I should include like, this long movie sample. <laughs> no, I was, I was, you know, the, the song is kind of like, like slowish and, 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 and ambient. So I was wondering, you know, take a, a, this snippet of uh, speech of some movie that you know, put through it through reverb and kind of stuff. I and mean, it's possible. It, you can actually take movie sample. I mean, if you hear the drums, 
These are not synthesized. These are actual drum samples, which are compressed to death. Because there's this nice trick about it that Windows has this thing called the Audio Compression Manager. You know, the thing, that actually, the thing you use when you're playing a video file back with media player. The stuff that, you know, basically, there are MP3 encoders built in in Windows. And there's a, this thing called the GSM codec, which is used, I guess they wanted to use it for VoIP, but it never did. But it's still there in every Windows, so why not? It actually becomes like, like, like one kilobit per sec, which for drums is perfect. For speech, you can already hear the artifacts and all this crap, but for drums, it's perfect. Again, you start with a little, little data, just a little small amount of data, what, what you use to later, what you, I mean, in my little sampler, I have the drums, and then I root it through a, f uh, a compressor, and then filter it, and then reverb, and then, you know, and in the end, it's in the mix. You can hear the artifacts if you really want to, but it, when it's in the full mix, you don't really bother. And again, for example, the hi-hats. This is just white noise. This is just simple white noise, ran it through a couple of filters and envelopes and all that kind of stuff. And if I can, yeah, this sounds a lot more noisier this way. And all it does is you have this pattern. Oops. This is just very simple, you know, white noise with, you can adjust the envelope so it kind of like, you can choose between like shorter or longer and that you can emulate like open and closed hi-hats with it. And then I route it through a filter and all of a sudden it sounds like an actual hi-hat. So um, it's really a simple way of working. And um, that kind of simplifies the whole process. Sure, I mean, when you're making actual music, you probably won't end up like, okay, white noise, and then you fade it out, and then you filter it. You can do it if you want, but I mean, uh, normally you wouldn't do it. This is one of those like unusual, unorthodox things. But, you know, just loading in drum samples and using synth, that's pretty much a normal thing. And uh, it works really well for 64K, especially if you are into those kind of music. I mean, obviously, if you want to you know, want to have a speed metal song, you probably won't be able to use this. But, but for, uh, for the most part, it works. And I'm going to show you something that hasn't been presented before, I believe. <laughs> I believe because we haven't done it because we just finished it. But we're actually working on the third generation of our tool. Now, this is called Attic 3. And, uh, I would normally say that, you know, we haven't tested it. We just released a demo with it. But um, this is actually used in commercial productions now. Because we are working commercially on a game that's uh, an MMORPG. And uh, what we did is that we had this tool set. And we kind of thought about, like, you know, we have this tool. It's really convenient for the graf graphics artists. Because when you're working on a game, you have to have some, like, uh, middleware. Because you know you have Photoshop and you have 3ds Max and you have all these kind of tools, but somehow you have to fit your those data that comes out of there into your game. So you have to have middleware. And we realized that you know if you write importers for this, and then an exporter and then the code, which is already our code, can import this crap, then in the end you have a really strong middleware, and you can even create content this then this thing. So. Uh, I'm not sure if I can show it as properly because uh, this is really weak laptop, but, but we have a couple of interesting things with it. First off, uh, oh, I don't think you can see this on the screen, yeah. This is actually part of the login screen of our game. It's an online game, you have a login screen. And this is around 8 kilobytes of data. Now, I have to admit we were too lazy to actually use that kind of data, so in, in the end, the player does download 9 megabytes. Because <laughs> we really didn't, like, what you would need to do is, like, generate the data and then save it. And the save it part was kind of, like, lost in connection. Lost, like, like, we didn't really bother to write it. And we didn't want to let the player watch the progress bar grow every single damn time. So we kind of just, okay, well, bandwidth is cheap, just, you know, 
one day we will do it, I guess. Um, so uh, the nice, interesting thing about this new thing is, let's hope this works. Yep. The new thing about this tool is that the texture generation, which I talked about for the first part, is entirely GPU based. Every texture is generated on the GPU in shaders. Now, what, I, what you've seen that when I showed it earlier, that the texture generation was kind of slow in the old tool. We actually managed to generate, and this is a, a, a 1K by half K texture. This is generated on, an, on a fairly decent, like a GeForce 6000 series card, basically less than like one tenth of a second. It's ridiculously fast. And you can implement everything in, in your shader. It, and it's really small, because shaders have this interesting thing, in Direct3D at least, that you can store them two ways. You can store the text of the shader, which is ASCII, which is compressing well. Or you can store the bytecode of the shader, which is pretty repetitive, so it compresses well. So any of your shaders would end up probably around, at least, I don't know, I don't know a couple of hundred bytes. But you still have, like, 30 shaders in there, you're around 3K, but it can do your entire texture generation really fast. And of course, the nice thing about it is, you see this texture, and uh, hopefully I won't screw this one up. Uh, this layout is something you might know from work, so like, the operator stacking layout. And it's actually a really, really convenient way for some to work. Uh, our graphics just hated it. Was like, he was more of a tactile guy. And um, we kind of made uh, this cross between because uh, our actual editor, that actual 3D editor, is kind of like this front end for the whole operator stacking. Like internally, it's still, still operator stacking. But he doesn't want to see that, so he just use, uses like little animation curves still and, and little placing around objects still. And it becomes a stack, but he doesn't want to care about that. He just wants to do it in some really convenient way. Now, the nice thing about this is at any point, you've seen the other, the other tool that I had to actually like, look through the stack. I still have to, but it's more visual. And if I uh, select any of this stuff, and I want to change it, like let's pull up the turbulence on this one. You can see that I can change one of those parts, like uh, this is like this this uh, overlay, the the red overlay thing. And if I change the seed, you can no, it's actually the black thing. You can see the black thing changing, and. The importance of this is that every single step can be surveyed. Every single step you can watch and learn and try to change. And uh, it's a lot more convenient to actually be able to see all the steps. And you can, even if, if you say, um, oh yeah, now I know why I don't see it, because it's alpha. You can just place all these, you know, have five versions of it, and if I change one, see, it, it goes through all the steps, and in the end, I will see this result. So uh, it's also a really convenient way of working, which is the reason why we're able to do this game uh, in our way. We don't have to actually depend on other tools. And um, I guess uh, 64Ks in general have this kind of weird ease to the whole thing. So nowadays, a less and less of them are released. And I would like to encourage everyone who is programming or has this kind of like fetish to do cool stuff to, to at least give it a shot. Because I think we're still around halfway at most of what's possible in 64K. We've some, seen some amazing things, especially the Fairlight guys have been doing some really crazy shit. But I still think there's a lot of space to be learned. I still think there's a lot of headroom to go. 
And I would love to see anyone break that barrier. Because if you break a barrier, then people follow. And people will make even more amazing stuff. And I, I like to think that we were one of the groups who actually kind of raised the bar. And which, is, which is why people don't make any 64Ks anymore. Because they're like, wow, there's a lot of work in it. You know? it's like, I mean, really, I mean, making a t tool like this, we've been working for four years on this thing, I think. So there's a lot of work in it. And we just started actually making shit with it. This is the, like, we're actually in a phase of like, whoa, we can actually use this thing. So uh, there's a lot of work in it. But um, I think it pays off at the end because you're making cool stuff. And I would like to encourage everyone to do it. I mean, it's not hard. You've seen it's not hard. It's just work. And um, yeah, and also, this is kind of like I said, people are not really making 64Ks anymore. So if you want to take the lead while the others aren't watching, it's my pre maybe your time. And I can recommend it. So if you, if you have any questions, I can probably, you know, Froggy? Uh, the, the bus tool, is that available? Uh, it's Askware. Okay. <laughs> I just heard that term last week, uh, last week, the breakpoint. <laughs> It's, 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 it's basically the, 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 this very demo scene-ish thing. Again, give a man food and he'll be fine for a day. Give a man you know, the knowledge how to fish and he'll be fine for the rest of his life. And, um, <laughs> which is why the normal way of demo scene knowledge sharing is that you don't ask for the code. You just ask for how you do it. You ask for that 10% of missing information you don't know. And uh, that's why. I mean. And the other thing is that it's shit. Like, it crashes a lot. So it's like. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I can probably give it out. For, I already gave it out for a few people. No one actually made anything decent with it. Um, so it might be worth a try. Well, are there any other like, similar type programs out there? Because I don't know of many procedurally based synthesizers. Well, Farbrowse released their own, the V2. Okay, true, yeah. And, and that's, that has been vastly popular. And this was the first time at Breakpoint when Basically, half of the competition in the executable music was using V2, but it was the first time it actually was like raising eyebrows because this is. I think this was now the time when people actually like started to harness of what's in there, and people started to make something else than what's almost usual with V2. Like you, it has a certain characteristic of sound. The old synths do have the characteristic of sound, but it was the first time people tried to get around it. So I was actually curious about the results. And um, a lot of 4K synths are, are available. Those are a lot more restricted and, and, and quirky. And 4Ks are general are coming up. And I still think the music is, is still uh, not entirely exploited. I hope to be one of the <laughs> guys who actually like make something that's un unbelievably loud with it. And, um, and yeah, I think. There might be some 64K since I think the Cryonics one might have been released. So but there are some. Okay. I don't, yep. Uh, I, I was wondering if, if uh, either uh, Buzz or V2 or any of these other tools were approaching spitting something out that wasn't necessarily an executable but was something more like an XM or an S3M or something like that. Uh, yeah, I understand the question. Uh, the point about it is that. Uh, XMs and S3Ms and stuff, they all have rigid stored sample data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, the, the idea being that somebody could, uh, somebody could kind of standardize the synthesis engine or a way to talk to synthesis engines. And, um, um, and I know that that's kind of general MIDI. But, but yeah, yeah, well, general MIDI does that, partly. My synth doesn't. Uh, V2 actually does, but the problem is, uh, you have all this range of music sequencers, you know, from Cubase to uh, Renoise. They all have their own respective worlds, and they don't want to talk to each other. You can you can be lucky if they can import the same kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, for V2, that has been a problem. Well, I don't know if it's been a problem, but it certainly was an issue of how to get the sound data out of the the tool because. If you use logic, you can have a different. You, you can have a logic project file, but you won't get any data because it's not documented. And even if you do, someone else will be using Cubase, and then it's something completely else. So they did the, like this little trick that the plugin has a record button. So what they do is like <laughs> press record and then just run the whole song, and it dumps out all the data into like one big swag. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. And uh, 
For me, it was easier because Buzz is, well, not open source, but at least it's kind of like documented, even if it's not official and even, the, even if the ocu official documentation is a piece of shit. But, no, it is. It's, I swear to God, there's a, this text file about how the, how the, the BMX, like the format of, of Buzz looks like. And it's like wrong in several places. Like, I mean, for some reason, um, all the plugins have the, the ability, the chance to, uh, to output uh, data into the file, like custom data, basically, if it's not a pattern data or stuff like that. And I used it in my sampler just to store the samples into the, the actual uh, BMX file. And for some reason, I still have no idea why, it actually uh, stores one byte more. Like, there's, there's an extra byte, I don't know what it is. I just know I, I, I like write out eight bytes and then I read back nine. <laughs> and you have to skip the first byte for whatever fucking reason. And it's like, I don't get it. I, I, it's like, and of course a lot of stuff is wrong and a lot of stuff is undocumented. And of course it's not, well it actually kind of is developed. And you might have heard that Buzz is in development again. Like they, they lost the source, but then recently the guy found some old hard disk and the source is there again. <laughs> And, and now it crashes even more. <laughs> and um, I actually didn't dare to use the new version because it's like they, he, they, he keeps introducing new features with new bugs and you know, loss of backwards compatibility and everything sounds weird. And I keep wondering what the hell. And I didn't dare to use it anymore. But, um, but yeah, to answer your question, standardization, I don't think it's, un, it's, it's, it's an or, uh, a problem in our level. I think it's 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 a problem on on people who manufacture music sequencers. Uh, I, I, I mean, there are there are free sequencers out there, like like Sangsta Manufacturer or something like that. Yeah, Z Tracker and stuff like that. So yeah. yeah, that would be possible, but I guess it's so quirky and uh, I mean, think about that. Buzz uses Buzz plugins. Every other sequencer uses VSTIs. That's already two separate separate things. It does. It does. It does accept VSTI, except that it's a hack because Buzz is a tracker, which means notes don't have ends. Uh, yeah. yep. Like in a MIDI note, you have a start of the note yeah. and the end of the note, exactly. so you can shorten notes to any one, any any arbitrary short, uh, length. The problem is it's two different worlds. Now, if you would, if let's let's dis disregard Buzz as yeah. you know something from Bizarro World. Even if you know you have several VSDI trackers and stuff like that, they all all have weird features. I mean, some of the trackers you can feed multiple MIDI inputs into VSDI. Others don't allow that. And then you have you know different effect chains, and and some of them has like buses and submixing and all that kind of stuff, and others don't. So, and of course there's there's um, I don't think there's much of a demand for it yeah. <laughs> like from from the professional angle there's also like like reaper and and and, and less commercial well less commercial how can you be less commercial but but like uh, non uh, super duper studio quality uh, music sequencers that probably are much more open to that those suggestions but um, I still think it's not a problem on our level if someone does it hey fine I'll be happy. Finally, I can, I can work with other people who are using Cubase and I'm using Acid and we can import new each other's stuff. But um, I think it's, it's, it's a bigger munch than we need. So. I don't want to go to that length because the, <laughs> the thing about it is that if you if your software relies on bugs, then you're gonna get screwed at the next yeah. update. So, <laughs> but I mean, yeah, we've discovered some interesting ideas of like how to, like we actually came up with a method of storing arbitrary size data in 64K, literally. 
Like you can take an MP3 and store it in 64K. It won't be 64K, but it would look like that. And it only works on NTFS, and I already saw more than I should have. <laughs> and that's, it's not a bug. It's a documented feature of NTFS. But I'll let you figure out the rest. Yep. <laughs> it works. And RAR supports it. That's the funny part. So if you have like this 4 megabyte RAR with like a 64K inside, and you're just hoping no one notices. <laughs> but yeah, those are like, th these are like hacks that you don't want to, that's like, you know, one of those 4K intros last year at MVC, and that actually like, what they did for music is like they loaded up the, the, the music samples in Vista, and they just chopped out parts, and they made this like sound collage of it. And you had like this, these like um, crackling and drumming and stuff like that, and they all the, like filtered them to death and just chopped that like, like half a second parts, but it was so organic, everyone was like, what the hell, how did they do that? <laughs> and all that they did is like, you know, they took this like long four minute Britpop song and just chopped the end chord out, which doesn't resemble the rest of the song, but they like applied it into the music and stuff like that. And everyone was like, dude, you're, you're cheating. And it was like, well, cheating is what, you know, people yell when someone notices a trick. No one else will use it because it's already cheating, but it wasn't cheating when they found out. So um, you can exploit and you can find some weird shit, but um, I, feel, I still think that that's not necessary. I still think that mo most of the tricks you can do is still fairly legit. I mean, okay, we use Windows fonts. That's pretty much it. I mean, that was a 4K intro, I never forget. There was a 4K intro which had like this insane geometry. And it was like, how the hell did they do that? You know, this big, huge uh, structures made and it was completely complex. And how did they do that? And then we started to realize, like, those actually look like curly braces. <laughs> and turns out they just took the Windows font, they took the, the, the tessellation code from OpenGL, and just started building these structures from letters and, and like, you know, dashes and, and whatever. It was like, you know, it was almost like a screwed version of ASCII art, except you wouldn't notice. <laughs> but yeah, um, they also made in like a second intro where they, they used that for, for like building a giant spider out of like, like uh, brackets and stuff like that. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't notice. But yeah, I think th uh, stuff is definitely possible. You just don't know how, how dirty you want your hands to be get. The, one of the interesting thing about demos is that you want to have longevity. And if you're exploiting a bug, then, then you know, I don't think that that, that 4K intro that uses Vista music is going to run on Win Windows 7. Because Windows 7 probably has a different set of music, so it's Vista only. And then you will just realize that every time you want to show that demo, you can either stick to the video or, or, or use Vista. Because Windows 7 won't be able to run. Windows 7 will be able to run our stuff. Because it still has OpenGL and Direct 3D support and everything like that because of the backwards compatibility, because of the games. But, you know, if, if, you're, if you're relying on something that's not documented, then, you know, you can run into traps. So, if anyone else is willing to ask a question. Otherwise, thank you for coming. I hope you're not too disappointed for Tim not being here. Uh, I still have his CD, so if you want to dive into processing, which is a nice toy to re-implement demo FX from 93. Uh, you can just take a CD or, or look at uh, apparently this is possible.com, which is actually a quote from a, uh, an old PC demo. We actually argued about it. which one. <laughs> yes, it's Unreal by Future Crew. When you have like this effect and the text goes, apparently this is possible. <laughs> um, but yeah, thank you. <laughs>